guys, welcome to this week's podcast. Uh, this week we are covering homosexual Vikings with Denton and Michael. So guys, where are we starting this week? Denton, would you like to uh, take the honors on that? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, this uh, kind of came up because of my um, video mm. on my Denton's Tales of the Viking Age about Viking homosexuality. Or I suppose more correctly, it should be called Old Norse homosexuality mm. because you didn't have to get in a ship and go somewhere in order to be one or, or be not. But, um, and the video is certainly getting an awful lot of attention at the yeah. moment for some reason or other. But the most interesting thing I think about it is that I was challenged to prove, to prove that homosexuality existed mm. in the Viking Age. Now, as I said, since it existed everywhere else, it would be very strange if it didn't exist in, in Scandinavia. But uh, I said, well, where is your concrete proof? And, of course, it's never mentioned in the sagas to any uh, at all. Um, but then straight sex isn't really mentioned either. Having babies and that, but not kind of how to do it. But um, the I mean, we don't have a rune stone that says, you know, Eric Bloodaxe lusted after Eva the Bone Splitter or, or anything like this. Mm. But I think the best proof is that in Iceland there were specific laws directed at homosexuality. And logic dictates you don't make laws about things that don't exist. I mean, you know, we wouldn't make a law now about regulating horse trams because we don't have any. But while, while there were no laws in the pagan times, there was nothing enacted at the all thing about homosexuality. So it would have been well, it would have been legal in the sense that it wasn't actually illegal. But when the Christian church came along, they brought in specific laws about homosexuality. And I would say, well, there is all the proof you need that it was there. And um, I like to quote, it's quite interesting. Around 1200 AD, the Icelandic homily book, as it's called, uh, came along. And it refers to the terrible crime, and I quote, those appalling secret sins perpetrated by men who respect men no more than women and violate quadrupeds. Um, and 10 years of penance and flogging was prescribed as a punishment for adultery between men and sins committed by men, quadrupeds. And that women are mentioned as well because they say, if women satisfy one another, they shall be given the same penance as men who perform the most hideous adultery between them or, yes, you guessed it, with a quadruped. Now, I don't know what was going on in Iceland with quadrupeds. I probably don't really want to know. But I suppose all we can say is that in those days, men were men and Icelandic ponies were very worried. So I, I think I think that proved the existence of it because well why would they bring in the law hmm. so that's uh, that little piece out of the way <laughs> yeah that's quite interesting um especially with punishment towards women as well because i have come across um sources in italy um where they were kind of oblivious to uh women on women pleasure and it was more of penetration um where men penetrating other men was completely sinful that was wrong so it's very interesting that the icelanders cover women as well that, that's quite yes a, a lot of societies where there was prejudice it tended to be directed against men mm. women seem to kind of get away with it as yeah, you say the penetration great. thing um, I yeah to across, a yeah i have come across sources all right um in the irish sources that punish women you know are cross-dressing or doing various things but it's not to the same amount as men um, I recently, this morning, I found a um, one source during the 13th century where a Norman knight became a uh, woman and then went off with another Norman knight and then the following day he became a man again. But in this, when he, interesting enough, when he becomes a woman the first time around, he curses it. You know, this is a curse from God, which I found interesting in itself. All the literature that shows a person becoming feminine or dressing as a woman, so on and so forth. It's always God has turned the person into um, that. It's never that person chose to be feminine or um, dress as a woman or anything. It's God created that person that way, which I found quite interesting in itself. This is never, um, you know. That is, that, is, that is very interesting that God created them. Of course, you could also say, well, if God isn't capable of making a mistake, well, then there wasn't anything wrong with them. 
it's true. Like. Way of it. Either that or he screwed up one, of, one way or the other. Hmm. But, um, it is. The, 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 the other... Um, no. You said something. Yeah, I was just well, trying to explain that to the Inquisition when they came uh, knocking no. on the door. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I saw how to, it's very interesting because the Christianity was very anti-homosexual. I think you slightly touched on that as well, Denton, in um, your video. Is it very, very much, uh, very much so? Yeah, and um, uh, it would have been something that. Uh, the Christian church would have been very, very uh, down on, you know. Um, it could also explain the thing with women there because they were not too keen on women anyway. I mean, yeah. they they went after people who were devotees of Freya uh, more than they would uh, men. You know, they were, they were quite uh, hot on that. Mm. And um, the, the other interesting thing I, I, I was challenged on was that all the people I cited as being gay or bisexual um well where's your proof you know and you can say well you know julius caesar didn't get the nickname the queen of bythia for nothing uh the church were uh on to uh richard the lionheart about his fondness for uh, boys um you know i mean lord kitchener's lover died with him on the ship when it was was torpedoed so you know there was all those all this is just myths and stories so, well no it's it's not you know it is it is actual it is a fact, as well as we can establish it, because a lot of these things are, there is an awful lot of hearsay and reading between the lines and all this kind of thing. But um, yeah, so that that uh, that was something I, I was challenged on, but I, I think I explained that fairly, yeah, fairly well. you touched on something very interesting there with Alexander the Great as well. Um, Alexander the Great was extremely feminine as well. He wasn't just a gay man. He was a very feminine gay man, and that's what got him into trouble. It wasn't the fact he was going off with men. It was the fact he was very feminine to doing so. And it's very interesting because the Irish literature, now I can't say I'm a great at um, Latin literature and Norse literature, but I'm quite good at Irish literature. And in the Irish literature, it's the same thing again. It's okay for uh, people to be more masculine. Like when a woman dresses as a man, it, you know, it, in some of the literature there, it's seen as a gift. Uh, for instance, one woman dresses up as a man and becomes, you know, join, joins the clergy, and that's seen as a gift. Compared to when a Norman knight becomes, dresses up as a woman, it's seen as a curse by God. And that's very interesting that feminine traits is seen as a, you know, a curse by God, and yet masculine traits, people act, acting masculine, that's seen as a gift. You know, I, I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> It's interesting. And well, with like Alexander, I mean, in, in Greece, um, there's no problem with a man having sex with a man. Well, in, no, in Athens and quite all, some, some wouldn't have liked it. But most of the Greek states, uh, you had sex with a woman for reproduction. But if you wanted satisfying equal sex, well, you had to have a man because women were, well, they were down with the cattle. Um, so Alexander having boyfriends, as long as he was tough and macho, that wouldn't have mattered. But if he was a bit, ooh, sort of thing, yes, they wouldn't have liked that because his masculine manliness was not affected by having sex with a man because that's fine, that's okay, you know. But if he was kind of feminine, you know, it, and I mean, that, that brings us to the, the, the Norse idea that the one on the bottom is the, because they've accepted a female role. The guy on top is manly and he's, you know, he's uh, showing his status. And... I mean, that that was done uh, after victory to show your your conquest over people. I mean, you could you could rape someone, man or woman, simply to show I am now in charge. I can do this if I want to. So a man having sex with a man in that context, he was being masculine. He was showing his dominance. But the guy underneath taking the feminine role. Now, okay, if it was a captive of that, well, he didn't have any choice. But that would have been the shameful. That would have been the uh, the shameful thing. And a man volunteering to take that, as you would in a homosexual relationship, well, of course, that would really have been a no-no because this guy has now willingly accepted the female role. He hasn't been forced to do it. He's accepted it. And that, of course, that would make him, well, non persona grata. So I think that would have been the reason that relationships like that would have been kept very quiet because you wouldn't want to admit that you had willingly accepted the, the feminine role. I mean, Odin is... Um, uh, called names by Loki because of uh, Seder uh, and that he has taken the feminine role. He's accused of being Ergi, you know. Um, so, you know, um, 
the the this their curious attitude by the north that it was fine as long as you were on top but it wasn't fine if you were the guy on the bottom yeah. it does seem a bit, a bit weird but uh, yeah uh, because i've I seen i don't uh, think it's um oh, no i was just gonna say um no that's right thing is um you gotta remember things like if you look back at the ancient priest spartan shield of the uh arrow like that it's quite phallic and it is actually meant to be a reference to your know, genitalia and mm. sword as well is quite a phallic item as well and it's uh it's a powerful item you know um it's the man's weapon the man's weapon <laughs> and so uh <laughs> you know and that's that's a reference there um that ancient uh persians that always reference about the phallus and um are and its relation to um, war and, like you said, uh, rape. Like that, it's it's the dominant thing, um, the dominant of the two anyway. And uh, I think that's an interesting link. But there is a uh, another thing on there about women and men. Women were yes produced, but for a week of a month they're out of action and for. Um, obvious reasons as well, you don't reproduce it all the time. So how do you get off? Well, if you have sex with another man, there's no risk of impregnation. And there's no you know, that risk as well. So there is a saying in, uh, that was taken from Persia but that is where women were for breeding and young men were for fun. Right. And that is, you know, that is a saying that's missed said now in a kind of uh, not a nice way but it's but the reference has come from Persian sources and, and those two worlds were very um, like that. so you know that's something as well that I just thought was very interesting and, and of course uh, I think a very interesting point too is people seem to forget that Norse society was an agricultural society, agricultural and fishing. People have this idea that all the Norse did was get in ships with nice little dragon heads on them, sail off and burn things and, and rape anything with a pulse. Uh, but I mean, the majority of Norse people probably never went anywhere in a ship. Yeah. It was an agricultural society. And in an agricultural society, what do you need? People, lots of them, you know. And before the days of old age pensions and retirement homes and all this, as you got older, mm. uh, it was a good idea to have plenty of children who could carry on the farming, fishing, or indeed going raiding, if that was what you were doing. So producing offspring was very uh, important. And I'm sure there would have been a great attitude that basically any any sex that didn't produce something nine months later was kind of a waste of material, yeah. if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and maybe if there was a very specific requirement to produce children, um there were penalties actually for not doing it they had um a man was called a food floggy uh, if he wouldn't like have children basically that meant a man who ran away from a vagina and a woman was a uh, a flan uh, which was a woman who ran away from a penis basically um and that was actually a prescribed thing it was your duty to have children um and there's nothing really prescribed about that sex but the one thing that was prescribed was not having sex to have children that was that was a bad thing and you could be punished for it yeah. so you know anything that did not produce children would have been considered not very good but i think if you had done your duty you know if you had produced children there's the kids you know there produced them what you did after that in your own time probably wouldn't have aroused any great interest because you had done your duty to society you'd married you'd had kids and I think that could be a, quite an interesting, an interesting uh, factor. As I say, the, the agricultural nature of North society is nearly always overlooked, because even most of the raiders would have been farmers, fishermen, blacksmiths. Very, very few of them would have been professional raiders. That's all they did. Well, um, even like they did get that right in, in Vikings. One of the few yeah. things they did get right. Well, Ragnar and that and Lagatha are farmers. Yeah. You know, and then he goes off in a ship, he becomes a Viking, but he is actually a farmer. Um, so that's that I think is uh, that does have uh, quite a, a bearing a bearing on it. Yeah, it's that's extremely interesting, Denton, that you uh, bring that up because if 
The reason why I keep going back to Irish literature, not only because this is an Irish podcast, but you have Vikings who live in Dublin. And we know by 872, they are following Irish law. So I'll bring in the Irish law now. In Irish law, it's very much um, trying to get men and women to reproduce. Um, a lot of the laws, especially divorce laws, are justified that if a man can't get his woman pregnant, she can leave him. And she can get take all the rights and stuff with him as well. What's very interesting as well is when I was going through the sources and stuff, this also covered um, men who made transformations into becoming women and vice versa. And there's divorces as well um, within the literature as well that covers this. Um, so I found it very interesting how we started off with people saying, oh, well, there's no proof that people were gay in the early medieval period. But yet there it is. It's in the source. It's as black and white as can be. Um, not only do you have men who are... Um, taking part in men and men um, sex you also have women having sex with other women and that's in the literature it's black and white but you also have men who dress up as women and get you know jiggy jiggy as well <laughs> you know so yeah. that's interesting yeah. and on top of that that is very interesting mm, and on top well, of that well, mm. it, yes and i i think it seems to be fairly obvious that there were a lot of things that were tolerated in pagan society years before mm. but as they came down to christian times were not yeah. um i mean pagans were always more open uh and tolerant than the christian church ever was um even you get some even like the, the, the people who say well there were, there were no female warriors in ireland uh yet a law came in i can't remember now in which century uh, prohibiting the continuation the of the training of mm. female warriors so if they had never trained any well why would you bring in a law saying to stop training them? Yeah. You know, but um, pagans were always more accepting yeah. things and tolerant, and we we see that I think very much in like when you see Christian missionaries going to Scandinavia in the early days, they weren't tortured, they weren't killed. Generally, they were either ignored or they were told to go away. Yeah. And I think it's a pretty good idea what would have happened if pagans had sent missionaries to a Christian country. Yeah. I, I think they would have been invited to a barbecue in the town square and they would have been the barbecue, you know. So you you, you have this completely different attitude, which I think also is uh, probably uh, relevant. But as I say, we, we don't have any direct evidence really one way or the other in the sagas or anything like that. Um, it's, uh, it's very much a sort of reading between the lines, inference, what was going on in other societies. Very much like our knowledge say of the voller mm. so there's very little we know about what they actually did mm. we're told they sang songs or well, what song they 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 recited chants or well, what were the chants so all you can do is say well what did the sami do what did the germanic tribes do they'll compare shamanism and well they probably did something similar but we can't actually say well this is exactly how they did it because we simply don't know because of course they never, never wrote these things they wrote these things down and we, we could do a mass from the 11th century because we've got the text yeah. but you can't reproduce a, a vulva ceremony exactly you know um we know say they were lifted up so they could look into the next row what did they say what did they do what was the special song they sang well you know we have no idea even odin he he tells us all these uh, songs and what they do but he doesn't tell us what the words are so which is nice for him he knows them but you know you, you can't say well i want to do that because sorry you don't have the text you know mm. it's it's a bit like having uh, all you know about Hamlet is his father died, he talks to skulls, and he's not happy. Well, that's not going to get you much help in, in doing the play. You know? mm. Yeah, it's so true. We always only get like a little keyhole into the medieval and ancient periods. Um, a lot of time, it's really a tease. Uh, for example, going back into literature now, and I know I bring up Celtic literature a lot, not only because I specialize in it, but you have um, Celtic culture and you have Norse culture pretty much living side by side. When I say Celtic culture, I'm talking about the literature from the Welsh, um, Irish and Scottish. And the Norse and the um, Gaelic people are living side by side. So I, I might as well bring up the literature and stuff. But very early on in um, ancient Gaul, um, you do have a reference from Julius Caesar where he says about um, two Gaulish men rolling around naked. That's the little keyhole you get. And it's your imagination that has to fill in the gaps. And it's pretty obvious if you have two men in a field rolling around naked, you, you get a fair idea of what they're up to. 
Yes, well, I mean, they could have been wrestling, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, Caesar doesn't go into any great detail, and maybe that's why. <laughs> you know, rolling around, he just leaves you to, you know, figure that out. Because they were, they were pretty free in Rome, too, so I'm sure people would have known what he was talking about. So, <laughs> yeah. We have to remember the Saturnalia, you know, and all that, so they were, they were uh, quite, uh, quite lewd in Rome. Mm. You see the, the artwork oh. on the walls in Pompeii, you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it is interesting, and that's really the thing. Oh, sorry, Michael. What, no, no, Michael. I think that's, that's the thing. We mm. do compare other societies, and that's the right thing to do yeah. because they all have impact, even if it's hundreds of years. You know, you will have had ancient Germanic tribes mingling with Romans on the frontiers, migrating north to, uh, to Denmark, um, and towards Norway, and that's a slow migration, but. For these influences do have that effect, and we do see it in every society, even societies today that we see it as uh, backward, but they still have maybe closer ties to their. They'd be more in common with the medieval ancestors than, you know, in in the hills of the Himalayas or uh, the, uh, remote parts of Africa. Um, and we do see sort of trends still of uh, you know their ideas of spirituality, their ideas of worship, we can take reference to start our investigation sort of um, you know, things that they got up to. Um, but yeah, like you said, the sources, the Celtic sources where we get um, sort of merged together where it fits because every culture does have its own twist, which I think is something the church very early on was trying to almost eradicate by creating its own culture. Yeah. You know, it's the first yeah. time we see people getting down. And because in, in Norway and Denmark, things could change from almost village to village. You yeah. could meet a chief and a homophobic person on the planet for whatever reason, you know, and he, but then you go 20 miles up the road, you're going to have another one. And these, these people had influences that you got to remember it's pockets of societies there that would have their own because it's not written down Norse law Norse but I mean, they have ones that are passed down orally but I mean, they that me you know I'm passing down a law or I'm, I'm telling the young ones about it and I put my own way spin on it because yeah. I believe something different and that's something sure. you know the church the church tried to almost eradicate and say look Black yes, yes. God, uh, church tried to make everybody the same, like uh, follow, like yeah. well, we need to tell you what to do. And I, I think, too, there, there's a great similarity between a lot of the Norse practices and ideas and the Celtic Irish. Yeah. They're very similar societies. Um, and I mean, like when, when, when the Norse went to Britain, of course, they were dealing with people who were actually their relatives because the Saxon, Anglo Saxons were Germanic and their languages are similar. But in Ireland, I mean, the, uh, the Celtic Irish and the Norse were very, very similar cultures. Mm. Uh, they had a lot of similar ideas. So they, they would have got on quite well together. And uh, uh, apparently they did. I mean, that there's this image of constant fighting and all this. But I mean, there was actually more trading and cohabiting going on between the Irish and, and the, the Norse uh, than fighting, you know. And, of course, you had this uh, interesting thing where an Irish chieftain would help a Norse chieftain to clobber an Irish chieftain he didn't like. And then, you know, he would help the Norse guy to beat up some Norse guy that he didn't like. There was all this going on. So I think the two could sort of intermingle quite, quite well. But when the church came along, of course, they wanted to sort of steamroller everything. And, no, you can't have your own ideas or anything this is this is what we're going to be able to do you know and i i think too even on the, on the homosexual question the like of snorri and that probably have been very careful what he wrote down i mean he could have known things that he wouldn't have written um like a lot actually a lot of these spells and and, and, and chants and that may have been known they may have been handed down by word of mouth but the likes of snorri might not have wanted to write them down because the church might see that as well this is how you summon satan yeah oh so it's quite possible that a lot of that he wouldn't have written down even had he known it but that's what i find very interesting that um a lot of the irish literature that goes on about um people dressing up as women and women dressing up as men that's written by the church 
so when I was reading this, I was very surprised at how much um, detail it goes into. Even the story of the Norman Knight in the 13th century, which is very late. And that's a period that's very um, homophobic. And yet, there's a priest writing down. And he, he's the one that's writing the words that the Norman Knight is... He, 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 he's pretty much questioning the world. The Norman Knight asks, why would God turn me into a woman? You know, that's what the Norman Knight says. And you have to remember, it's a priest who's writing this down. The priest is, out of all the things that the Norman Knight tells the priest, the priest is still remembering the fact that the Norman Knight said, why would God turn me into a woman? This clearly is a curse, you know? And he's, what's very interesting is that he never, for me personally, is that he never turns around and says, Oh, I made myself into a woman. I dressed up as a woman. No, it's God made me a woman. Since I was born, I was born a woman in a man's body. And this is God's curse on me. And I thought that was really interesting that even today, a lot of people would say that they were born in the wrong body. And that's the same, literally the exact same feelings people had in the 13th century. And I even the priests are recording this. And I found that. Really That's fascinating because, uh, as you say, that is a very modern acceptance of the fact you can be born in one, uh, in one body, but you think you're, you, you know, you're, you're something else. That's a very modern concept. And for someone to have put this in the 13th century and not sort of uh, been raining down curses or anything on it, but writing quite sort of almost sympathetic about it, that is actually quite quite amazing and rather rather forward thinking uh, really you know that, that's a, a, an amazing thing and uh, and for it to be a priest because of course as you point out these things were all written by priests yeah. like the accounts of the vikings it was priests and monks who were writing them mm. so they demonized them because they were the people who were getting raided <laughs> but uh, that, that's quite fascinating that that tale. I, I wasn't actually aware of, of that about the night but it's it's fascinating fascinating to uh, to hear that yeah for anyone listening um the book is here i'll be actually putting up um the link after i'll write a dope and stuff and um because it's mostly a medieval irish story of sex change is the name of the book so i'll be posting that with the uh name and everything in the link because well, that is certainly interesting sex change in medieval <laughs> yeah that, that's that's fascinating what i and the thing is although i read it through once I did get to a point where I was like, right, who's writing this? And I found out it was the abbots. It was the priests and stuff. And I was like, what? They're writing this stuff? What? You, because you would think out of anybody, they would just be like, put this in the bin. This doesn't deserve to exist. Yet they're the ones recording it. And it's the same. Like I, I, would expect, I would expect they would either have ignored it or would have held it up as, a, as some dreadful example of punishment from, from the Almighty, or, or what did you do to deserve this kind of yeah. thing? You know, but yeah, that, that is that is curious. It really is. And even more for like the language that's in this, the Norman Knight turns around and says, "I don't deserve this curse. I have done everything good. I have welcomed other people into my kin. I have, you know." I can't remember the other examples he uses, but, you know, he went to church every Sunday, you know, he gave, you know, his food to the poor, all, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And he says all this, and this is highlighted that he doesn't deserve this curse. And yet he feels he was cursed by God to, to be born in the wrong body, which I found really mind blowing that, you know, someone from the clergy will write that once I asked the question, okay, who's writing this? You know, it really opened the door for me. Like, and it's, yes, it is quite interesting. It's the same thing that I ask about why the uh, church records the Norse gods and the um, Irish pagan gods. Like, I find that really interesting as well, that the clergy are willing to write this all down, that they found it important enough to write this history down. It's just like, OK. That is, that is interesting. Yes, you, you'd think they would either have ignored it or they would have demonized it very much, which they didn't. They tended just to, to record it. But that, that seems to have been very much a, a, an Irish thing. I mean, I don't think the church was as open to pagan practices in other countries yeah. as they were in Ireland. Uh, it was almost as if the, the sort of pagan things became a little more acceptable to the, the church in Ireland than they did uh, elsewhere. Mm. Uh, that, that does seem to, to have been the case. Um, well, of course, the church themselves did, did use so much pagan stuff. I mean, they used the wells, for example, and they built churches near sacred groves and that to try and sort of get people interested. And they had it was their water being used for baptism and all that, whether that had anything to do with it. But they do seem to have been a little more tolerant 
um, than the the church in in other countries, certainly than the church in Italy or Spain, for yeah. example, well, look, where the the guys in pointy hats would get you, you know. Because I did find um, Italy and um, Greece very interesting as well, because the um, author of this does highlight the fact that um, Irish literature is very much influenced by the Greeks and Romans, and they too had references to um, gay acts, you know, as we were highlighting there, and it's. The church doesn't decide to burn all this literature. They keep it on and it becomes a part of the Renaissance. And even the author here finds it very interesting like that we can find um, links between ancient Rome and the early medieval literature. Um, certain the way that um, we have um, the changes between man and woman and how people feel cursed, etc., etc. You know, it, it's quite interesting. Like, certain Sorry, I was just going to say one of the points to remember is that if you're writing the literature, you control it. Yeah. You control what gets said. So you are in charge of because if you don't write it, someone else writes it, do whatever they want with it. Or if you just let it fester in the background for those pagans to worship, uh, you know, that will just grow. That's a, that becomes a threat. So it's almost though it can be seen as, and I don't want to say that it is that way, but you see this is the way of controlling the, you know, controlling the news, controlling the media of the time um, and bending it to how you want. You've also got to remember as well that when the church um, came across to Ireland, these are Irish monks who are around this time. So their grandmothers, their mothers may have had these sort of, they have these links to the land. Themselves. Um, whether they are, you know, they, yes, they're Christians and I'm devoutly so, but they're still in tune with their culture, mm. and it's still in them. So that's the same thing that they would know the stories their grandmother told. You know, they would know that it was a very oral culture anyway. You know, yes, they, yes. They mm. So they were able to recite their family going back millennia. Something we lost to do, and um, that. So that the, these these young men who were writing this down would have. And I can guarantee you, and I'd be the same if I was being told I had to write something down. But I want it to favour, make my culture look good. And it makes me look good. You know? And that's yeah. the thing. Is, that's sort of another angle to look at this when they're writing that down in Ireland. That's, that's very true. And uh, certainly uh, there was a great deal more sympathy for the ancient uh, ways among the Christians here than in other countries. Well, like with the, the Sheila and the gig, the... Uh, things that you find on churches but you know I, I think uh, getting back to homosexuality among the norse I, I think it's quite fascinating this often bottom thing because you don't really find that anywhere else in other societies the fact that two guys are doing this that's the thing that you know they don't like oh two men doing it no no you shouldn't do that that's wrong but there's the, this rather curious attitude that if you're on top it's okay if you're on the bottom it's not um i mean you don't really find that that i'm aware of in any other the uh, other society and while i i think that probably is why it's it was not something that would have been talked about because as i say if if you were the guy on the bottom uh well you know if you were a captive if you were being forced to be there no, there's not that much shame on you insofar as you were forced to do it because you can always say well i didn't choose to do that the big guy with the sword he, he made me you know but uh if you voluntarily chose to do it well, of course then you were definitely ergy and you know could you trust a man who had voluntarily taken a woman's role could you trust him in battle could you could you trust him to lead you aggressively into combat if he was prepared to go back and Oh, darling, like I'll be on the bottom today kind of thing, you know. Um, I, I think, you know, would have been the main reason why um, uh, partnerships would have been uh, very discreet yeah. because you couldn't really admit to, to, to doing that, you know. And um, But as I say, all the, all the people that have said to me, you know, the, how, could there, how could there have been you know gay vikings you know they they can't seem to get their head around the idea that you know vikings could have been gay i, I think because they have this kind of stereotypical idea of gay gay men you know 
they would see a gay Viking and say, oh, darling, I couldn't possibly go on a raid. I mean, that big axe thing, I could break a fingernail, ooh, you know, so all the blood, yeah, spoil my clothes, you know. I mean, but this seems to be the sort of idea they have, which is, is a bit ridiculous. Yeah. But, um, as I say, this top and bottom thing, I haven't seen that anywhere else uh, that I'm aware of, where you had this, it's shameful to take the bottom role, it's manly to, to be on top. Uh, in other cultures, um, they, they didn't. They didn't have that. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is. Uh, I, I find that quite fascinating. I still <laughs> reckon it happened within the Irish um, culture, though, because if you take the Fenians, they just have this. Uh, Saint Patrick records it, and it's so random, and that's nipple licking, you know. And oh yes, yes, yeah, and it, it's. So what happens is that St. Patrick is making his escape and he, he's about to jump on the boat and the man who's uh, running the boat, he's a Scotty, he's pretty much a pirate like and he decides to bring um, St. Patrick back to Britain. But as part of the agreement, he has to lick his nipple, he has to suck his nipple. And St. Patrick explains to him, look, it's not a part of my culture, I'm a Christian, I don't do that stuff. And it's very much believed that um, John Kerry brings it up and he believes that it's a part of the Fenian culture of nipple licking, um, which I find very um, interesting that the Fenian or the Scotty, as they're called in that period, um, refer to, uh, you know, or into nipple licking. So you wonder to yourself, do they push it to the next level that if St. Patrick had accepted the nipple licking, you know, would things have escalated some, you know, somewhere else like? Well, you would wonder, yes, yeah. yes. You'd wonder why would you, why would you stop at licking nipples? You know, I mean, you know, yeah, there's more fun bits than that, I should think. Yeah, um, yeah that's, it's, uh, that, that's interesting. Yeah, and it always goes back to what we were just saying there, that, when it comes down to these references and other references, we always just get the little keyhole. So we're, we're trying to explain this. It's so easy for the other person to turn around and say, that's nothing like, you know. Well, sure. That is very interesting because it is it is one of those clues, as I said in one of my replies on the other thing, the reading between the lines. You see something like that. Well, here's a guy wanting someone to lick his nipples. Yeah. Now, if that is not a bit, you know, homoerotic. I, I don't know what is. Um, so, but yeah, that that is just one of those little clues. You kind of think, well, no, if that was an accepted practice, you know, uh, what what else uh, would have been would have been accepted? And, and as you say, if St. Patrick had agreed, well, what would have happened after that? One would hardly think they would stop at nipples. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but that that is very interesting. It, it's one of those little where you say, ah, that's that's interesting. You know, there's a Pointer. Well, societal, societal rules to sex existed even before the church. There, you know, there have always been boundaries, as in, like petting is sort of acceptable. You see it in Greece and the Middle East um, that the boys or the men, young, a young man would be effeminate. Mm. You know, it was seen so you couldn't have someone with a big bushy beard because that would be taboo. But do it to the, the same person who shaved and made themselves look effeminate would be no problem. And then you see, you know, there are certain rules for the church about how you're met early, like literature about how then you don't be taking the stance of an animal or, you know, these sort of like. So the, I think there's always been sort of societal sort of, well, you can like pet, but, you know, don't be going all at it. Um, that's a bit weird. And uh, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that, yeah, nipple licking was seen as okay. Yeah. And then once you get past that, it starts to get a bit of a grey area. But again, I think it, that's sort of twist I was saying about. And like you've said, they're dancing about how the one on the bottom is, is, is a strange that you don't see it in other cultures. But I think it's just a twist of everyone's got this foundation they just to their own, yeah. their own but uh, of course uh, also, what, what about quadrupeds i want to know about those quadrupeds yeah. right? <laughs> but, uh, I, I, experimenting boys maybe who had no females i mean i know <laughs> i know sheep were worried but you know i i, I uh, anyway but, uh, it, it, it's it's interesting <laughs> Very hard, of course, with so many, you know, so many things regarding the the old Norse, to be sort of pontificating with any certainty about a lot of things. Um, 
I mean, the religion we know really nothing about. Yeah. Uh, as I say, we, we kind of know what they did, but we don't know how they did it. Um, and a lot of other things, you're, you're relying on accounts by Christians a couple of hundred years later or by someone like uh, Ibn uh, who, uh, Fadlan who, who saw the, the burial. Um, and it, it is so hard to get to the actual truth of it. And it, it's such a pity that the Norse didn't use their runes to write books, yeah. which they could have. I mean, they could have written anything, but instead they used them for decoration or putting up monuments like, you know, um, Ivar was here and he went off and died somewhere or, you know, th th this kind of thing, which doesn't really help us uh, very much. And so much of it is guesswork inference or, well, like you say, the, this uh, thing about the, the nipple kissing where you get some little tiny clue yeah. and you can, you know, maybe start building building a picture yeah. um, or yeah. see there's a count of people rolling in, in fields because I think there was, a, there was a similarity among most of the pagan peoples of Europe. I mean, the Germanic tribes, the Gauls, the uh, Britons, they all were very, very similar in a lot of their sort of religious uh, practices. I suppose we can sometimes uh, infer that, well, if they did this in Gaul, they probably did something like that in Britain too, you know, uh, kind of thing. Yeah, because so. I, I found doing the research for this, it's very much, because um, my field itself is Irish literature, as you know yourself, and the reason why I go so much into Dublin and stuff is because um, Dublin is in Ireland, so the whole Norse culture really does affect Ireland and stuff. And it's interesting that if you put what's happening in Dublin and stuff, with what's happening in Ireland. You literally sometimes, a lot of times you can put two and two together. And it's very interesting as well that in um, the Latin literature and stuff that influenced Ireland in 410, and then later on you can connect that with Dublin and stuff, that it's acceptable behavior in paganism. And that's why earlier on I talked about the Celtic literature and how Julius Caesar himself comments about two men rolling around naked. And you do wonder, well, if they're doing it in Gaul, which has a cultural relationship with Ireland, most likely they were probably running around naked in Ireland. So when St. Patrick comes in and you have yes. a pagan who turns around and he says, oh, well, I'll let you on this boat if you give me a bit of a nipple lickle, you know? You know <laughs> yeah. It yeah, well, I mean, it, it, does paint, it does paint a picture. I mean, if somebody today, if some, if, if I said to you, uh, listen, Philip, I'll do that for you if you, you, know, you know, nipple here. <laughs> How would you take that? You know, yeah. I mean, it, it certainly doesn't sound like I am going to audition for He-Man, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that is an interesting little clue. And uh, uh, with Gaul, too, don't forget, there was a lot of Gallic migration to Ireland. Yeah. And it's thought yeah. that the Fear Bulga, some of these are actually from Gaul and, and uh, came to Ireland. So, um, you know, you could have a, a, a connection there. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a fascinating, fascinating subject. It's a pity we don't know more about it. No, because so much of it, yeah. 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 so much of it, someone yeah. can come along as people. Well, we'll prove it. Well, where's your sources? Where does where does anybody say this written? You know, well, you know, they don't. You have to kind of go digging, yeah. go digging for that. Yeah. But I, uh, I, I think. Well, yeah. even on top of that, I've always found as well when I turn around and says, "Well, you know, Julius Caesar says there's two men rolling around naked there." They're always like, "Well, you know, Greek wrestlers." Greek wrestlers, a picture of two Greek wrestlers, and they're underwear wrestling. They're not, yeah, they're not, getting they're not Greek. <laughs> oh, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, an interesting one, all right. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, I think, I mean, I, I think really the, the best the best clue we have to the, the homosexuality among the Norse. Um, and I'm not saying Vikings because, I mean, you know, it's the Norse really we're talking about. Uh, it has to be the, the Icelandic homily book and the other legislation that came in. Mm. Because, uh, as I said, like at the beginning, if there was no homosexuality, as a lot of people claim, why would the church see the need to bring in laws about it? Yeah. You know, you, you, don't need, you don't need a law about something that doesn't exist. So if there was none of this going on... and they go into so much detail about these appalling crimes and the quadrupeds and women pleasuring women. There's a, but there's a, quite a lot of detail there. So the fact, obviously, men were doing things with men, women were pleasuring women, and everybody was having a go at quadrupeds. So, you know, this was happening. And we think this is a couple of hundred years after the conversion of Iceland. So, um, you know, it wasn't just, oh, well, this was going on in pagan times. This was still going on in Christian times because that's when they made the laws. And um, I, I think that is 
to me, that is conclusive proof. Those things were going on and quadrupeds were being abused. And of course, they didn't have any preventative cruelty to animals, people in those days. So poor old quadrupeds. Yeah, we can but feel sorry. So it, it's very interesting. I think there I can see you. <laughs> It's very interesting how we move into our conclusion that it seems to be that we can see the link between the Norse and obviously the Irish and then also with Latin literature, as we highlighted with Alexander the Great. And with Alexander the Great, it wasn't the fact that he was um, gay was the problem, it's the fact he was very feminine. And the second major problem as well is having children, as we highlighted with early Irish law. Um, the laws are very much set and made for people to have multiple children to contribute to society. And in fact, mm. there's a reference of that where a um, man, we don't know if he's born a man or a woman, but at the time, at the start of the story, he is a monk in a church and where he transforms into a woman. He has seven children with a man and then he becomes a uh, man again, a monk. And that's acceptable because he's have, he, he has seven children. He's contributed to society. So it's okay for that person to become a man again. And that really supports... Whatever he does after that's okay because he's yeah. had the kids kind of thing. And it really supports what you're saying there that the reason why it's not acceptable is first off, you know, being feminine on the battlefield, that's not okay. You can go and do what you want to do, you know, in your private session. But if you act... Uh, feminine well clearly you're just not a good warrior and clearly you can't be on the battlefield although actually if you dig into history you can find a lot of people that are very feminine it's not not just um, Alexander the Great but also um, the Sun King in France his brother was extremely feminine he always wore a dress around the court and stuff and he was one of the greatest generals of all time yet at the time people had the point of view that we're uh, picking up from what we've read in our literature and stuff, that it's not okay to be feminine in those societies because that was seen as weak. And if you weren't able to have children because you're too busy being with men, that's also not acceptable behavior. So it's interesting that in both Norse and in Ireland, we're coming across the same um, team, um, especially when we look at um, Latin literature and Greek literature as well, with people like Alexander the Great, where they face the same homophobic problems of, you know, well, if you're not having children and you're acting feminine, that's not okay. And, you know, that's not acceptable behavior. And over time, it does seem um, from the early medieval literature all the way up to Renaissance that it becomes more and more unacceptable for a man in particular who gets the main blunt of it. Women also get it very rough that if you are acting uh, feminine and if you're acting like you won't be able to have children, then that's just not acceptable behavior. So it's very interesting that that, <laughs> that could be the source of homophobic uh, behavior in society. So that's quite interesting. It certainly, uh, I mean, even, even like in Greece, um, you know, men having sex with men was fine because men were equals, mm -hmm. so that was okay. But if you were acting like a woman, that would not have been okay. And I mean, well, in Sparta, I mean, soldiers and like uh, apprentice boys and that, uh, there were sort of funny things going on. But no Spartan would have uh, would have uh, gone out sort of uh, behaving like a woman into battle. You, you you just wouldn't have done it. You had to maintain your masculine exterior, which was uh, very important. And the the same seems to have applied certainly among, among the Norse. Once you had kids and you were all macho and you were ready to bash somebody's head in with your axe, well, that was fine. You know, what, what you did otherwise was kind of uh, okay. Yeah. But don't go around with a limp wrist kind of thing because that is not going to work at all. Yeah. You know, you, that's, um, mm. uh, society, society, as you said, coming to the conclusion, society watches and wanes with a lot of relaxations of laws um, or its internal laws. And then, you know, as things, you know, you come off the, come to Thebes where they had two males that were lovers, maybe an army, and that's how they fought. Uh, Sparta and the Agogi, yeah, like you said, with young boys, um, and that was part of their culture. But these are quite prosperous. How are these happening? Prosperous. Yeah. And then if you see when we start to see the Norse sort of uh, migrations out of uh, Norway, and there's the uh, talk of uh, hidden population, that yeah. you, you might see the 10 people not to want to engage now, not to allow because they're on the brink of maybe possibly extinction or they feel they're under a break because they're not getting the relationship as they want. It's the same when you see like 
people of the era come goes further and further. We come back of a black death, multiple plagues, and stuff like that. It's not surprising to see homophobic elements appearing because it's like that's a threat. It's almost a threat to you know if everyone suddenly wakes up and turns gay, well, yeah. we'll have no children to carry on. So it's, it's, you've got to bear in mind the environment that these people are in at that time as well, and that, how that can change uh, people's opinions of the time. Absolutely. Well, I, I think it, it, it's quite interesting that there was um, a legal requirement among the laws, if you like, to marry and have kids. That, as I said, that the, the man or the woman could be accused of running away from the, the sex organ of the other sex. Um, and that this was, this was greatly frowned on. You could get into trouble for re refusing to marry, refusing to have kids. But they, they didn't. there were no corresponding terms of that for anyone... Uh, who was having sex with someone of their own sex. They were worried about people running away from the opposite sex because they weren't going to have kids. Yeah. Uh, that seems to have been the thing that concerned them uh, uh, mostly. So the, the having children was the important thing. And uh, un, unproductive sex, of course, well, you know, that was kind of a, 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 a waste of material, as I said. But um, that, that, that is, uh, I think, also something very interesting, that we have these two terms specifically referring to people who didn't want to get married, didn't want to have kids, but we don't have any similar terms referring to people who were not getting married and having kids because they were in some kind of same-sex uh, relationship. Um, and, I, and I think that is quite uh, an important thing, that the, the having children was the big thing, and it was the thing that you could get into legal trouble for not doing it. Yeah. That, I, I, I find, is, is quite... Uh, Quite into that combined with the later Christian laws about homosexuality, um, I think you know these, these things all put together do certainly provide a, a pretty conclusive uh, picture of the you know the uh, homosexual things going on as they did in in other countries. I mean, you mentioned Sparta, and even in Japan with some of the samurai, um, this was you know this, this sort of thing was going on, or, or or in North America. I mean, the American Indians or the, the Native Americans. Uh, call them now i mean they had quite a few genders yeah. and they were very open to man woman um bisexual transgender you know they had i think it was something like five genders they recognized so you know they were they were quite ahead of uh, other places in that regard yeah very very interesting mm. conversation that we've had tonight as we just close up as always once I we haven't offended anybody this is, this is the important and actually i would also like to point out this stereotypical thing about gay men you know or lesbian women you know this idea that all gay men go around with one hand like that and they're all pansies i mean i, I would not like to have told richard the first or julius caesar that they were whatever the equivalent term was for a poof not not a good idea and i mean i i i i've seen lesbians who are absolutely gorgeous miss spain one year was a lesbian i mean this, this is a beautiful woman so these stereotypes are they're like all Scotsmen wear kilts. All Irishmen have red hair and are pissed out of their minds all the time. Well, a lot of them are pissed out of their minds, but they don't all have red hair. But, you know, th these stereotypes, are, that's, that's really what, uh, what they are. Which exactly. Are, uh, something like, and we can see that with Alexander mm. Great, who's supposedly, the, in, according to literature, the most feminine of them all. And yet, that's the guy who took over most of the known world, you know? And, and he, didn't, he didn't lead his army from a couple of miles behind. He was out in front, exactly. You know, so this, this is not a, this is not a, a, a pansy by a long way. This, this guy, he was right out in front leading the troops. You know, you couldn't false his masculinity by at all. He was dead. His body was covered in um, all these slashes, bruises. His bones are smashed from various injuries. That's why they find it so difficult to find out what exactly killed Alexander the Great because. Um, a, a theory that he died from one of his wounds is actually a very strong theory uh, because he was Possible. constantly leading from the front. And that's the exact same. I, sorry for this, guys, but actually for, um, going outside medieval period isn't my speciality. But there's actually a very feminine, um, very famous general. Um, he is the um, Sun King's um, brother. And he used to wear a dress all the time when he wasn't out battling and stuff. And he was one of the masculine people in uh, not masculine, but he was one of the greatest um, generals in French history. And yet this guy used to wear a dress in his free time. So turning around and saying that um, gay, if anyone who's very feminine is very, you know, couldn't lead an army or anything is ignorant, completely ignorant to history. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know. 
Yeah. So on that conclusion, thanks very much, guys. I really enjoyed this uh, session. It was completely mind. It was interesting. Yes. Yeah, extremely mind opening for me. It's one of my favorite podcasts so far. But no surprises with yourself, Denton. Uh, last time we had a podcast, it was amazing as well. <laughs> oh, what can I say? My genius just shines oh, forth. I can't help it. Like, and as always, <laughs> thanks, Michael, as well. Um, I know your cold was acting up for a good bit of it with the sound waves yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And the old phone was a that goddamn cold. Yeah, sorry, but. <laughs> <laughs> but um as I um thanks very much guys i'll make sure to put your links below and i'll send that over to denton as well so you can check this over in denton's channel as well as always thanks very much guys and all the best <laughs>